Welcome everyone to I4J's 11th interactive video presentation and Q&A session with the wonderful Steve Denning. Steve's topic today is why U.S. entrepreneurship is dying. And uh, just as a quick intro, my name is Ben Baldwin and I'm hosting this series for David and Vint. I started the series because I think video is a great way to share and help each other learn. So um, that's what I'm doing. It's not my day job though. As a quick intro, I'm the founder of a company called Scale Driver. We do innovation consulting, though instead of consultants, we match executives with real innovators like founders and disruptive CTOs in a system that predicts innovation success and accelerates. So I'll get everybody to do an intro of themselves before they ask Steve any questions. And of course, Steve is going to introduce himself. But uh, I, I like this uh, live video format because it allows us to interact and even ask for help but there are a couple of rules with it. So I've started out by putting everybody on, on mute. And all I request is that, um, just as I've done, is that if you have a question, please introduce yourself to Steve and also to the audience so that he and the audience know who you are. And you can also use the chat feature on the right side of your screens to get in touch with the group or with me. Um, and then last point is that, uh, so there are people from outside the I4J community who are participating and it's being recorded. So. Now I'll get out of the way and turn it over to Steve. Take it away, Steve Denning. Uh, thanks, Ben. I'm uh, happy to be with you. And uh, I, um, I write about innovation and uh, management and leadership. And um, on the uh, issue of um, US entrepreneurship, uh, I have to say that I was a skeptic for uh, a long time as to whether this was really a problem. I mean. The U.S. is renowned for its entrepreneurship, a social force that made this country the envy of the world. So when I read about uh, the fact that entrepreneur entrepreneurship was dying, uh, I was uh, pretty skeptical. But I eventually was persuaded by a number of studies that suggested this is a huge problem and that uh, it's been going on for quite some time. I mean, just to summarize some of the studies, the National Bureau of Economic Research uh, shows that uh, startup activity has been slowing down for three, over three decades and dropping sharply over the last 10 years. That new firms accounted for about 13% uh, of all companies in the 1980s and only 8% uh, two decades later. In the 80s and 90s, uh, the small number of young, innovative, dynamic companies grew at very high rates uh, since 2000. Um, they've been slowing down uh, quite dramatically. The Kaufman Foundation had another study showing the percentage of adults owning a business has been declining since the 1980s um, when the foundation first began to track that. And the Brookings Institution uh, found that the startup rate, number of new companies as a percentage of all firms has fallen by nearly half since um, 1978. So this was um, fairly convincing. And so I started to look into it. And um, it seemed to me that uh, the usual explanations didn't uh, provide good answers. Uh, the decline has been going on for some decades. So people who pointed to recent phenomena like uh, latest administration or the financial meltdown 2008, that didn't seem very plausible. Um, noted the usual suspects, big government, high taxes, regulations, uh, didn't seem very plausible. I mean, when innovation was high, 70s and 80s, I mean, the tax rates were much higher than they were now, and deregulation was uh, only just getting in, underway. And uh, at the time, U.S. had many highly regulated industries, and uh, California produced Silicon Valley. And uh, even today in California, it has some of the highest taxes and uh, some of the most uh, dynamic entrepreneurial activity. So those kind of usual suspect explanation didn't seem to make sense. And uh, the study by the National Bureau of Economic Research, uh, its explanations also didn't seem to be very plausible. I mean, they cited credit constraints, um, rising investment in equipment, outsourcing of work, uh, larger companies, uh, acquiring younger firms. None of that seemed plausible. It's not that those factors weren't relevant, but they couldn't seem to me, at least, to explain 
a phenomenon of this size and, and persistence. And uh, this was really quite implausible to me because we live in, in a time of unparalleled technological possibilities. I mean, with the internet, everything that we do, every, how, how we work, how we play, how we learn, everything is being reinvented. So you would imagine that this would be a paradise for entrepreneurs. And yet, here, entrepreneurs are dying. So what's gone wrong? Well, the article that I wrote uh, suggested we might look at student debt. Um, this is a $1.2 trillion phenomenon, and uh, it's been growing very rapidly uh, in uh, recent years. Average debt graduation to college students um, is uh, uh, much higher than it was 20 years ago. Early 90s, it was less than $10,000. Uh, today, 70% uh, of the graduating class have an average of $37,000 in student loans. And the, the uh, total sum of student loan debt uh, is $60 billion, 12 times the amount that it was in the early 90s. And the increasing student debt is caused by two factors. The meteoric rise in the cost of college in the US and the fact that the states have disinvented, disinvested in uh, higher education and as a result have passed on cost of these uh, higher costs uh, to students. And uh, while it's expensive private schools like Harvard that get most of the press attention, in actual fact, most college students attend public uh, universities where the increased costs are at the heart of the student debt crisis. The, uh, and uh, there are also worries that the, uh, as to whether this is actually a good investment. Um, the cost of paying off loans uh, wouldn't be a problem if, in fact, students were all doing fabulously well in the job market. But the position uh, seems to be uh, Quite, uh, quite the opposite, and that many students, uh, obviously many do well, uh, quite a, a high proportion uh, don't do well. And that the very interesting study by a think tank called Demos showed that the, the negative effect on income um, over a lifetime is much bigger than the actual cost of the loans, that of the $1.2 trillion in outstanding debt, that will have a total lifetime cost of some four trillion for indebted households, uh, not even accounting for the heavy impact of defaults, which are really a, quite a, a huge problem. And uh, the, uh, what we're doing is, in a sense, putting this huge burden um, on the class of people who are least able to bear it, uh, people who are young people just entering the job market. And uh, the student loans are particularly burdensome because they cannot be discharged through bankruptcy. And so they are a permanent burden uh, throughout a student's life. And uh, uh, although there are various ways to uh, achieve forgiveness of the loan, even here there's a catch. The student loan forgiveness uh, is considered taxable income. So if you do get a discharge, you get stuck with a tax bill on that discharge. So the negative effects on this um, are plausible that they are a huge factor in this dying of entrepreneurship. And because the delinquency is a huge problem, uh, around 70% of student loans are severely delinquent. And in fact, only 37% of student loans are actually uh, in good standing. Uh, so there is a risk that the we're looking at a bubble, that, uh, and that students themselves are seeing that this is unreasonable, um, and could be accounting for some of the political unrest that we see in the current uh, presidential election. So this is really a hypothesis that I put to the group. We had a pretty exciting set of uh, comments, um, 60 comments from various people, and I could discuss those, but I was thinking uh, maybe I just pause here and see what the reaction to this uh, 
hypothesis that student loans are a major contributing factor to the dying of U.S. entrepreneurship. Yeah, this this is John Madison. Sorry, I don't have my screen live, but I, I'm just curious: um, have those data been uh, benchmarked against other uh, developed countries and um, uh, normalized for um, potential income? So, do we do we know if we're leading um, this this downhill path, or are we reflecting a global phenomenon? I, I don't have good data on that, but I, my take is that the U.S. is, is in the lead, <laughs> the like of passing on high costs to students. I mean, in, uh, in Europe, uh, continental Europe, um, the, um, uh, I mean, we're, uh, public finance of education is, uh, is very widespread. So I, I would be astounded if we saw the same phenomenon there. I do know that in the U.K., they are making rapid steps to emulate our brilliant example. Um, but uh, I don't have any statistics on it. Yeah, I guess, I guess the, probably the most notable exception would be Sweden, where um, any, any foreign citizen can move there, live there, not acquire citizenship, and get a free uh, advanced education. Yeah. Nice work if you can get it. Yeah. John, if you could just do a quick uh, intro of, your, of yourself. Just oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So um, I have a background in um, uh, evolutionary biology, uh, and uh, I practiced medicine for quite a while, and then I got into large-scale deployments. I've done a lot of digital health innovation at scale um, and, and do a lot of open-source work uh, and a lot of um, global initiative work uh, like I4J. Uh, across a variety of things. Uh, global genomics research and sharing is probably the biggest one right now. Thanks, John. Sure. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Just unmute yourself or uh, raise your hand and I'll see your hand raised if you use the, uh, the side chart. I'll give you a second for those who are participating by phone. Just a follow-up, I, I, I might suggest, because the thesis that Steve is developing is, is so profoundly critical, um, do, if, if there were a way to look at trends and metrics in a couple of countries, um, it might help make the case for a causative relationship between the burden of student debt and the decline in inter, uh, entrepreneurship. Um, that, 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 that might actually reinforce um, the argument. It, it might, but on the other hand, you might see that there are contextual reasons why entrepreneurship is low in Europe anyway. Uh, right. And so you're starting from a context in the US where entrepreneurship was high and it's in decline. Um, it's not obvious that if you compare that to say Denmark, where basically as education's free, um, but entrepreneurship is is very low. Um, I mean, what what would you make of the comparison? Uh, it's not not immediately clear that in the country comparisons are going to be useful unless you could find a setting which was similar to the U.S., which was uh, I mean, not, uh, on the face of it, I don't immediately see it. Right, right, that makes sense. Yeah, it is such an all-encompassing um, question. It's uh, it's tough to focus on. I mean, it's very bold as a uh, as a thesis, but um, you know, I, I wonder kind of the the where do you? My question is always kind of where do you start? Like, where, what's the easiest piece, Steve? That you think we can chip away at first? Um, like what's the what's that? most important part of the foundation that starts to either create a chain reaction or what do you, do you think that there's a piece like that or is this like a full sort of onslaught that we have to consider? Well, there are various pieces of it. I mean, <clears throat> if you ex accept the thesis, um, then there are things you could do. Now, if you don't accept the thesis uh, and some of the, the comments and the, um, on the article were, this isn't the problem. Um, 
I mean, Ivan was saying debt is good for you. That, that is healthy. That, that brings you in touch with the capitalist economy. And uh, so it, uh, it stiffens the sinews and summons up the blood, knowing that you have to pay off $200,000 and can't do anything with your life until you've done that. Um, I guess I and others uh, took a different view on that and, uh, and suggested that um, to impose such a huge burden on someone starting out on life um, with a debt that cannot be expunged um, is it just prima facie wrong mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and moral terms as well as economic terms. And if yeah. you, if you are going to have to finance education, that is the wrong moral way uh, to finance it. There must, we must find another way. Uh, so that was one, one line is to deny that there's a problem. But I, uh, I think the gist of it was there is a problem. Um, and of course, the, um, you have the various political candidates have put forward schemes. I mean, Bernie Sanders says, let's just make it all free for everyone and um, let Wall Street pay for it. Um, that, um, I guess, hasn't uh, materialized as the, the winning argument so far. Uh, but obviously, Hillary Clinton has moved somewhat closer to that and has an elaborate scheme to either re reduce or lower the cost for uh, a whole array of different uh, participants and uh, students in the system. So those are sort of financial uh, steps that can be taken to uh, both um, uh, reduce the burden on new loans. Uh, one could also obviously take steps to remove, remove this uh, uh, provision that you cannot discharge the debt. I mean, this is almost unique in the, in, in the whole uh, economy to have a class of debt that cannot be discharged. Uh, uh, it survives bankruptcy, survives everything, and even it can descend onto the, the children. Uh, in some cases, they've been stuck with paying the debt of their carrots. And quite amazing. So the inequity of that would be something that could be addressed and say, look, that's just morally wrong. And so we should alleviate that. Some of the comments. Steve, just uh, before you, just before you going on, I'm getting, I'm getting a little feedback on your on your mic. It sounds like there's either sort of wind or something brushing against it. Okay, I'll it's better. Try to stop. Sorry, I just heard interrupt. Yeah, much better. Um, this is Mike Nelson with a question. Yeah. Um, I'm one of the calling callers, and I, I work at Cloudflare, which is a startup in the Bay Area, and I also teach innovation at Georgetown in my spare time, and been very involved in R4J. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm certainly aware of, of the phenomenon you're describing. I, I teach master's students at Georgetown, and many of them are taking out 50 or even $100,000 loans to cover tuition and living expenses for a two-year program. And I, and, and I'm not sure they're getting re return on investment even from a program like ours, which is a pretty special program. But I'm also not convinced that at the end of the day, they're not going to go into a startup or not going to be part of an entrepreneurial culture because of that debt. And in some ways, it might actually be possible that they will be willing to take the gamble because they really want to be part of an IPO. They want to dream the dream and they want to get out of that debt as soon as possible, um, even though that's not always the case when you, you, you go into a startup. Have you looked at Judy Estrin's book from eight years ago called Closing the Innovation Gap? Um, it's a little dated now, but she documented in 2008 a 20-year decline in innovation in the U.S. and had a pretty sophisticated analysis of five different factors that were driving that. And, and, I, and you know, at the start of that decline, we weren't really looking at the debt crisis, student debt crisis that we have now. Her argument is that cutbacks in federal funding, short-termism, um, some, some, there's a, a series of challenges that she kind of documents and she shows how the U.S. has been losing in several different areas. But I'd be curious whether you, you, you sort of 
for the percentage, you know, on, on your explanation, because other people are saying that there's a lot of other reasons for the decline in innovation with your document. Yeah, well, I agree there are a lot of factors, and, uh, and I've mentioned some of them, and I'm not denying those are factors. Uh, the two that you mentioned, I think, are not terribly plausible. I mean, the short-termism is something I've written about at tremendous length, uh, but that's something that affects uh, existing firms um, and has a huge impact on, uh, on their, their returns. So um, I, I just wonder whether that- Well, but the, exist the, the existing firms are the ones who are often investing or buying the startups. And if they're not fostering the startups, they're not helping these companies grow, or buying them when they do grow, and there's, there's a, a problem there as well. There, there's just, a, I, 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 I'm really just worried that while your explanation can maybe cover 10% of what we're seeing, I, I think there's a, another 80 or 90% that aren't, isn't explained by, by your thesis. Well, I agree there are, there are these other factors, and I think serious uh, studies should be done on trying to weight the factors. So I've, I have been struck by the fact that student debt is hardly ever mentioned as one of them. And as it's uh, 1.2 trillion right now, and only 30% of the accounts current and the lifetime impact of that some 4 trillion, um, this would seem to me to be a more than loose change. Uh, it would seem to be a pretty sizable uh, uh, economic factor to be taken into account. And the other factor you mentioned about lack of federal funding, um, Again, I, I would I have to wonder whether that is a significant factor in, in startups, um, uh, whether normally federal funding wouldn't um, uh, be a factor in this. But obviously, lack of federal funding for all sorts of things has been a, uh, a, a major factor in uh, lack of innovation in existing firms. But I just wonder what impact it has in the... Uh, and the startup will. Um, but uh, well, the, a whole lot of the startups of the last 50 years are spin-offs from universities, and a lot of a lot of very talented people are no longer going into the universities because it's so hard to get a grant. It's so hard to get from graduate student to postdoc to professor. Mm -hmm. So there, there is a. Uh, again, that's that's one of the thing, things that people worry about. But I just, I again, I I I, I appreciate you bringing. I think it's also causing problems in the housing market. There's, there's a lot of, of ripples due to a, a trillion dollars in debt, and, and it's good to look at this impact on innovation. I just, I would hate to have people think that we fix this problem and we, we fix innovation. I mean, we have another another issue has been healthcare insurance, and I think Obamacare actually could help in that regard because a lot of innovation happens when 50-year-olds get tired of their 20-year-old job, and they go out and start a company. It's not all 22-year-olds. Oh, I quite agree. I quite agree. And often the 22-year-olds don't have the experience and the smarts and the, and the background to launch a startup. So, yeah, I see a lot of, lot of uh, <clears throat> uh, aged entrepreneurs who are uh, quite successful. So, I mean, this is a very complex problem. Um, I'm certainly not putting forward this as a proven scientific thesis. I'm saying this is a factor that hasn't received as much attention as it could have in this discussion, and it deserves to receive that attention. So, Steve, uh, thank you so much. This is actually very interesting. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the, the first is, uh, could you explain a bit again what is the connection between the student debt and uh, less entrepreneurship. Why, why does it make people less entrepreneurial, uh, less willing to start companies if they have student debt? That's one question. The other is, um, I come to think about our previous meeting uh, with Daniel Pianco, the venture capitalist that invests in, in uh, well, next generation higher education. And he, he posed the question, that, uh, you know, people have the choice today. You can either go to college, uh, pay hundreds of thousands of dollars and not know 
if you get a job afterwards, or you can go to a boot camp, pay a few thousand dollars, and have a 90% chance of getting a job afterwards. So maybe it's just going to take another channel and that colleges are out. Uh, what do you think? Well, I mean, they're, um, they're both good questions. On the, on the first one, what uh, chilling effect does that have? I mean, I guess I observe this on a personal basis on my daughter's friends um, who uh, have, and she's in her late 20s, and so she was, you know, went to business school, and uh, she was uh, fortunate of being the only child that she doesn't have a student debt problem. But, um, uh, but her, many of her friends and colleagues are carrying $100,000, $200,000 in debt, and they really have no choice but to look for a high-paying job in order to uh, try to pay down this, uh, this huge burden that they have. So, I mean, it's, it's, um, it, it seems to me just implausible to argue that it, that it is not a, uh, a problem uh, for someone starting out in life to have $200,000 of debt which cannot be discharged and which has to be paid. Uh, no matter what, no matter what bankruptcy or personal tragedy affects them. I mean, it seems to me that must have some chilling effect. How big it is, uh, we don't know, but it would seem to me it's obvious that it must have some effect. The uh, second question about the, um, uh, <laughs> the whether this education is worth it, I mean, that was a huge uh, uh, topic in the discussion that followed the article. And... Uh, uh, I mean, Esther Dyson started off by pointing out that this uh, massive uh, increment in uh, the cost of, of college uh, was a huge uh, part of it. And that was not <clears throat> spent for the most part on higher quality education. It was spent on um, fancy buildings and expensive sports teams and the like. Um, and when you go on the... Uh, the tours uh, that I did when uh, uh, when my daughter was looking around for colleges, I mean, that was what the presentations were all about. It was about how wonderful the rooms are and how comfortable they are, and here is the cafeteria, and look at the gourmet food, and um, this. And the administration of these uh, uh, colleges is where the huge part of this increment, 300% incre increment in, in in costs uh, has occurred. So there was a lot of discussion, well, why, uh, why had that happened? And the only reason that it happened was because there was this um, bottomless pit of funding uh, that uh, uh, basically these, uh, student, anyone can get a student loan. You don't have to be credit worthy. And the, there was no limit on how much really that you could, you could borrow. And so you had, in fact, a, a bubble a financial bubble situation being generated by unlimited supply of funds and colleges basically taking uh, advantage of it and providing uh, sort of resort-like facilities in order to attract uh, students to come uh, to the university and the colleges themselves are in an arms race that once uh, some colleges provide these luxurious facilities and all, all colleges are driven to compete by providing similar facilities. So there is a, a uh, sort of systemic problem uh, in, in the funding of the universities. That was just on the cost side, but on the benefit side, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I agree with Daniel um, that uh, the value of a lot of these courses is uh, highly debatable. And that um, uh, as a young person setting out in life, um, uh, if you were really able to understand the risks and the benefits, you might well decide, as Daniel suggesting, that this was a bad deal and to take out $200,000 in debt, uh, say for a legal education, uh, for most people is a very bad choice. Um, and uh, many uh, of them are suffering from having made that choice. Uh, but putting young people in a situation where they are forced to make uh, Choices like that seems to me, well, uh, not only 
a bad bad economics, but uh, just morally wrong as a way of running running the society, and that we shouldn't be putting young people in that kind of a situation by uh, telling them, look, if you want a college education, you come from a, a, a poor family, I mean, we'll finance it, but you have this horrible burden for the rest of your life. So, so um, just to follow up there, uh, you know, and, and you probably know my views here, but it, it, I, I want to just echo just said first that it's very strange that uh, this is happening when when we have so many more opportunities. And uh, my, my theory there is actually that we are, we, we're spending too little focus on, on building businesses that make people need each other more. And, and maybe too much focus on building business that makes people sort of uh, need each other less. So because an economy is always about that people should need each other and have a way to uh, compensate each other for what they do for each other, right? And it seems to me that they, this must be a question of mindset almost, but because there should be endless opportunities opportunities for making people need each other and now also we should be able to uh, combine education so that it kind of adapts to how people build the need for each other. All right, well I, I agree with all that um, thousand percent. I mean the education system is totally broken by basically teaching people how to regurgitate answers they've already been uh, uh, that have been found by other people um, when they should be creating lifelong learners. And then the, and the site visits of the learning consortium, the jobs that we see people have today didn't exist 10 years ago. And the jobs that people have today, most of those won't exist 10 years from, from today. The jobs that will exist 10 years from now don't exist today. We don't even know what they are. So to have an education system that's training people uh, to on particular skills um, uh, or teaching them how to regurgitate answers, I mean, is totally misguided. We need education from both um, kindergarten through 12th grade and college and postgraduate should be all focused on lifelong learning and emphasis should be on um, uh, creating people who can ask the right questions, not people who can regurgitate the answers that somebody has been uh, already already worked out. And so this, the education system is driving uh, the, the, the system and the population in exactly the wrong direction. And that is a, a problem that will not be easily or quickly fixed. I mean, it's uh, uh, standardized testing and uh, all of the things that are associated with that uh, keeps that system in place and we're going in the wrong direction in that area. So next uh, just to the final words, I, I, Werner picked up what you said, that we, it, it's the end of the road for the regurgitation economy. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I will sign that. Economy. I like that. We'll have to try to find a way to use that one again. Um, thanks, David. Thanks, Steve. And um, Charlie's up next. The question, then John. Hi, Steve. So, um, what I understand from what you're saying is that you associate uh, entrepreneurship with um, a certain kind of uh, economical thriving. Well, I come from Israel, and you know, I can't say that the entrepreneurial spirit in Israel necessarily comes from that. Um, I think that it's more, um, I don't know, because it's, it's a cultural thing, obviously, but I think that you're tapping into something really, really interesting about creativity and problem solving and what drives that. And some, I think that some kind of hardship is always needed in order, you want to solve a problem, obviously, so you, you become an entrepreneur, you want to do something, but when your problems are too difficult and you can't survive and this is what you're tapping into when you have to pay everything and put all your effort into surviving you can't be creative so the level has to be 
in some kind of comfort level, but not too comfortable. Mm -hmm. So don't feed the kids with, with, the, with the answers, as you say, and don't make them into some little, um, you know, non-thinking machines and more into the way one educates needs to be, um, I think it's more, it's actually almost less skills and more creativity. So we, you have to move away, you have to allow yourself to, to make mistakes and to, to try things and to be curious about things without having a definite answers. So the uh, definite answers. I, I think this is what you were saying, right? Right. I'd also be interested in hearing your views about um, how education is financed in Israel. Is, uh, I mean, Israel has such a reputation for entrepreneurship. Uh, I'd be interested in hearing that. But on the, on the U.S. side, I mean, I agree that there may be um, some elements which are uh, things may be too easy for some people and too tough for others. I mean, if you look at the overall income picture, I mean, basically the top 25% in the U.S. has been doing pretty well, pretty well for the last um, um, couple of decades, and the top 1% obviously doing even better. Uh, the owners of assets are, are doing very well, but the bottom 75% basically stagnating for the last uh, three or four decades. And that's one reason why you see the current political unrest. Um, so there are a whole group of people <clears throat> who are doing well and coming from families that are doing well. And there's a whole group of people that are coming from families and neighborhoods and, um, and whole regions which are not doing well. And it's possible that the people are coming from the well-off 25% are too comfortable and uh, and they're just coasting along and uh, and it's possible that the bottom 75 percent are have too many hurdles um, in order to become entrepreneurs uh, that that's an interesting hypothesis that uh, probably should look into but I'd be interested in your your take on Israel I mean how does how does Israel finance uh, education and uh, what impact does that have on uh, yeah. <clears throat> most of the education, I mean, the early childhood is, uh, is public, most of it. Some, it's becoming, there are more and more uh, private initiatives now because the level of the education is going down and people are more interested in giving their children mm -hmm. this education or that and to have more art or more sports or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, um, and higher education, everybody pays and everybody works while while studying uh, unless you're very lucky and you have rich parents mm -hmm. but but people are working really hard and that's the way i don't think it's but somehow i feel that entrepreneurship is not always got doesn't always have to do with education it's got to do with the way of it's a way of thinking perhaps, or a way of, um, a way of learning more. Mm -hmm. so, it, so it's an unblocked way of thinking or, or learning. Creativity is it. And, right. and that's the, that's the, this is what you were just saying, that we have too many uh, star tests and uh, SATs and uh, all, all these things that are, uh, I don't think that Einstein did any of that. But on the, the cost of higher education in Israel, I mean, is, yes, do, do people end up with huge debt burdens um, when they leave college and higher education? Uh, it's a little bit different, not as, not as costly as here, but people don't earn as much on the other hand. So, I mean, but it's just a totally different, different, um, I think it's I think it's less expensive. All right. I would be shocked if it's more expensive. <laughs> and, and you know, in, in average, less expensive. So I, th I think we um, thanks thanks Shelley and and um, 
and Steve, I'm just going to make sure we get uh, a round of questions in here from everybody. And John just has a quick, um, John just has another additional question for the next uh, 10 minutes before we drop off. We can sort of talk. Um, if anybody else has any other questions too. Go ahead, John. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. So, um, a couple of things. Um, you know, it it there, it's been said that um, the two uh, verticals most ripe for disruption are healthcare and education, and um, I, I'm involved in both. And, and the disruption that uh, the way that I would best characterize the disruption of healthcare needs is it needs to shift from a a hospital centric and a doctor centric uh, view of the world to a person centric view of the world. Um, and I think there's a direct analog in education. Uh, and that analog is that we have a, a research and a football team or sports oriented economy um, uh, for uh, higher education that needs to be flipped into a student-centric view. And so I've done a couple of three-day workshops with the University of Toronto, um, which is very aggressively trying to reinvent education in many ways. And, and the advice that I gave them is that I think um, every student who goes to the university um, ought to do a couple of things. They ought to pick a really big problem in the world um, that they want to, that they have a passion for it, they want to solve, um, and that um, they should construct a curriculum that's interdisciplinary, and and they get to define uh, with some approval process what um, what courses, what activities they need to do in order to become um, well skilled in order to take on the problem that they're. That that they're interested in. The second thing that they need is they need to have an employable skill as part of that curriculum. And the third thing that they need is they need to have direct exposure early in that educational system with people who are tackling that same problem in an industry so that they get a firsthand experience of the kind of skills and they get an opportunity to expose themselves to potential employers um, so that um, there's a connection between um, what it is they're trying to solve, uh, they have a passion about solving, what it is that uh, the curriculum they've established for themselves, and some practical experience. And so if, if, if we think of the problem as debt, uh, I, I think the question's been raised appropriately that it's more about value of education rather than cost of education. And people are incurring huge debt, but they're not getting a whole lot for it that qualifies them for a lot of available positions where they can innovate. And it's not, it's not, not that we want everybody to get out of college and do their own startup. I think that's an extreme that, that is, is, is uh, a certain percentage of people who want to do that. But um, we, we should assume that everybody who, wherever they're working, is innovating within that work context, both for the benefit of the company and for the benefit of their own uh, career trajectory in terms of acquiring new skills skills and network learning um, and continuous learning and creativity in their work, whether or not they're the founder of a startup or whether they're pioneering a product or a service line or a business model. And the last thing I'll say is that the, the instability um, of business models, the shortening lifespan of large employers um, as companies, um, and the need for continuous learning in order to be able to hop from one employer to another if you're not going to be your own CEO, which not everybody can be a CEO, or we would have nothing but companies of one, um, that I think all of those things conspire into the root of the problem, not so much being um, the debt alone, but it's the, it is the value proposition of how prepared am I to be either a startup entrepreneur or an effective contributor to an existing enterprise and have the, the skills and the ability to construct my own curriculum. So I think it starts with, I mean, all of this starts way before college, but um, if we're looking at the role of higher education from the perspective of the debt accumulated, I think that we really need to think about at that phase in their life, um, ought they not, uh, ought every student, 
uh, not have the ability to construct a path that's informed by the problem they're trying to solve and with those all trying to solve it. Uh, I, I fundamentally agree with the point that the education system is focused not on the student, but on the research professors and the sports facilities, and that um, there needs to be a, a total disruption of that whole system. And organizations, educational organizations, should be asking themselves systematically with every activity, is this helping education? Is this helping the student? Uh, or is it really part of this uh, grand financial scheme to advance the financial interests of the of the university by its football team or whatever. If you did that <clears throat> um, in, a, in a very rigorous way, um, it would have massive impact. I mean, basically, the kind of thing that Steve Jobs did when he came to Apple in 1997 and asked everybody uh, in the management, what are you doing that adds value to a customer? And around 4,000 people were unable to answer that question. And so their jobs vanished. And uh, so Apple became a, an organization totally focused on creating value for customers. If you did the same thing in a university, a large number of these administrative jobs would, would vanish. Uh, so the idea that we need to rethink fundamentally those educational organizations, I think, is something I agree with. Um, as to whether individual students can develop a map uh, of, uh, of their own career. I, my question there would be whether we would be putting too much burden on uh, young people who really have no idea what the world is about and are simply ill-equipped uh, to figure out what is going on. I mean, I think of my own case. I mean, I, I grew up in Australia and uh, qualified as a lawyer in, uh, in Sydney, Australia. And, I, and the system there was that you actually worked in a law firm at the same time as you were doing, a, um, uh, doing your law degree. And so I had a lot of legal experience as well as uh, taking the university course. So I had a, a, a very vivid window on what was happening in a law firm, of the kind of firm that I would work if I stayed in the legal profession. Um, and it seemed to me that the law firm was totally screwed up and the, and the, the people working there were um, uh, not the kind of people that I wanted to work with. So to me, it was a useful um, lesson is that I needed to get out of the legal profession. Um, so yeah, I, 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 would, I would agree. I, I would agree with your point that, that uh, college freshmen uh, doesn't know how to set up their own curriculum. And I left out a part of what I had suggested to University of Toronto, and that is that there be a very explicit mentorship program. But but let me come back to one of the point, the other points you made, and ab about how education needs to be disrupted. And I think you get what you incentivize in in all aspects of, of social engineering. And for me, the piece that's missing from college is what incentive does. Uh, a university have in creating effective entrepreneurs and effective um, contributors to the social fabric uh, and, the, and the economy upon graduation. And what if, what if there were some model that in lieu of tuition, you could pay a portion of your future income, uh, a percentage portion that would incentivize a university to make you to, to have a, 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 an economic interest rather than in the tickets at the football game in your future income. Well, I agree that that's a, a problem, but it's a, it's a pretty knotty problem because I, a couple of years ago, I was in a sort of discussion group with some deans of uh, business schools because I was arguing with them that the business schools should be uh, leading the charge in terms of transforming the world of management uh, and that this hierarchical bureaucracy that is essentially still taught in business schools was very retrograde and they should have different uh, different curricula and I mean two answers I got one was uh, 
look, Steve, that's, that's perfectly right. We should be, but <laughs> we are the cash cow for the university. Our business school is what funds the university, and many of the students come from overseas, and they are looking for a traditional MBA. And so if we were to even breathe the possibility that we were going to change our MBA and provide modern education, right. we would lose all of that funding. So that can't even be raised. Um, the other thing is you take um, the efforts of, say, Roger Martin, who was dean of the, the faculty of, of, of the business school at, uh, in Toronto. Um, and he says for 15 years, he did his utmost to modify the curriculum. And he admits that after 15 years, he only made two slight changes. 15 years of hard labor, two slight changes. That trying to change the core curriculum so Steve. is just like breaking into Fort Knox. It's not going to happen. So, so, so Steve, uh, I, this is David again. So uh, I, I can see that we are talking about two things. One is entrepreneurship and another one is education right. and the link between them. Right. And, uh, you know, you could say that you definitely need education in order to get a job, right? right. Uh, you probably need education of some sort to become an entrepreneur. I, I think that entrepreneur is like a, a mindset. It's something that people, people who are at its, I think only a few percent of the population are true entrepreneurs. And, and they are really, they want to give other people jobs, you know. While, while most people who kind of uh, just give themselves a job without a boss, maybe they just didn't like their boss. So they, they, what, I, what I hear here in a way is that education itself is actually ripe for a huge amount, amount of entrepreneurship. And, and maybe, maybe this is where future uh, you know, innovation policy for countries should be, that they should, uh, in, uh, in the technology agencies, innovation agencies, so on in countries, maybe they should focus a, a bit more on, on supporting uh, ecosystems around entrepreneurs who, who want to improve people's value and education and, you know, that kind of stuff. I agree with all that. I was just pointing out how, how difficult it is and the structures, current structures in place are designed to prevent it. Uh, so it's, 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 it's a very frustrating thing. So I, essentially, I gave up on the business schools and said that there are many more uh, participants and the uh, leaders in the world of change who are ready for change and the, the business schools and the education system is going to be the laggards and so I've left left that problem to others because the constraints are so severe but uh, I, it's not that it isn't worth doing or isn't urgent and important but it's uh, it, it seems to me it's going to be a very difficult and slow process and it will only happen once other organizations have become more entrepreneurial Great. Do we have a, a very last quick uh, question or maybe I should just, maybe I'll cut it off there because it'll, be, uh, it'll be a while. So we're at uh, half past now and um, I just wanted to say thank you to Steve and thank you to everybody who participated because this is obviously a, not just an important topic or two topics, but it's, um, it's something that affects not just us but future generations. So it's, uh, it's great that we can engage and talk about it thoughtfully, and uh, I hope that we can continue this conversation in the future with Steve, with everybody, because um, I'm sure we can solve this, just our group, right? And um, anyway, so thanks, Steve. Thank you to everybody who participated. We'll be taking a break uh, for the next little bit, just uh, because it's summer, and uh, but then we'll pick up the video Q&A sessions soon. So I would ask everybody who is even slightly interested to uh, please participate and sign up, email me, because these are a lot of fun. Um, and let's keep, the, let's keep the ball rolling. And uh, thanks again. Happy August. Thanks, Ben. Thanks all. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. <laughs>